Today, we welcome Dan Richardson, performance nutritionist. Adam, thanks very much for joining us today. Um, for those who aren't familiar with you, um, could you give us a bit of background, a bit about what you do? Yeah. So thank you for having me on. Really appreciate um, you know your time and letting me come on your podcast today. Uh, no short and sweet background of myself. Um, I started out as a rugby player, really interested in sport. Um, fell to a few injuries and was trying to find a way of you know getting around that, and that then led me to look at nutrition a little bit deeper. Probably when I was around 16 to 18. Uh, from that, I got really invested in that side of things and actually went on to university to study sports science, thinking that that would cover a lot of nutrition. It turns out it doesn't. It covers everything, physio, psychology, nutrition, strength conditioning, and all the rest of it. And I realized that I wanted to specialize in sports nutrition so I could deeper understand you know, my injuries as to why I got them and also help others um, you know, recover from injuries and also perform a little bit better. Um, so from there, what happened was I went on and did my master's degree in sports nutrition. Uh, that led me to work with multiple different clubs like Sale Sharks, Man City, uh, Warrington Wolves, to name a few. Um, and then I started up by myself um, working with schools, clubs, um, and one-to-one -one athletes um, as an individual nutritionist. Wow, very impressive. What was, the, what was the biggest difference working with Warrington Wolves or Man City? Was there a difference or...? Every club's different. So what I found massively, especially in professional sport, everybody has their systems and their way of working things. Um, and what I found more so was the delivery of nutrition had to be tailored towards those type of athletes. So for example, at Man City with the academy, we delivered a lot of kitchen sessions right. um, and a lot of personal stuff with the players and parents together. Whereas at Warrington, with it being the first team, we delivered a lot with um, you know the actual players themselves. There was a lot of one-to-ones, a lot of kind of markers measured such as skin folds, um, you know, their right. current weights and checking in on them uh, from a biological point of view. Um, sometimes even checking the urine to make sure that they're hydrated enough. Right. Um, whereas with the academy lads that we worked with, it was more about education um, and making sure the parents were on board with the message we were trying to deliver. Yeah. Um, and now you work, you work with schools. Yes. How does, the, how does that differ from working with a city or a Warrington Wolves? How does that, how does that, how does that yeah. change anything or...? Ma massively different um, so originally when I first got into the schools I thought I'd just be like working with an academy again I thought yeah. you know it's going to be quite simply just putting A and B together um, to get C but it doesn't work like that one thing that I think struck me the most was that every school is different yeah. so every school has a different niche or a different sport that they like to prioritize and focus on but they've also got that focus on the entire school as well at the same time so yeah. some schools might be very heavily rugby orientated and health orientated whereas other schools might just be very sporty across the board um, so I had to deliver and adapt my approach to make sure it was interactive, uh, fun, and also a engaging and educating at the same time. Um, so that came with a lot of cooking sessions. Yeah. Um, you know, there was gone of the lectures that I used to deliver with the Warrington players, um, you know, because people just wouldn't sit and listen to nutrition going on and on. So it was finding interactive ways of doing it, roundtable discussions, um, you know, chatting out on the field, turning up to games and discussing with players about their nutrition at training, for example, um, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's interesting you said that because actually one of the things we're working with Loughborough with, with on is um, students getting getting a chance to cook or to learn to cook, and that's something that when we launched the um, Elite Pathway, it wasn't something that I probably considered sort of really high on the agenda. But actually, the knowledge of being able to cook for both the parents and the students is something that is is big now in in the industry. Yeah. It's um, yeah, it's just something that I sort of really overlook. But if if let's say we've got a student who is really struggling with that aspect is there anywhere that i could sort of direct him towards or her towards is there any information i could give sort of to parents on on, on this is there any, it's sort of like an an easy sort of overlook of nutrition or is that a, sort of a, a really it's, sort of a yeah. silly question it's, it's tough because obviously most nutrition is individualized i yeah. think there's do's and don'ts of nutrition so if you're on instagram or social media don't just believe what you see on there go and back it up with some research it's, it's good that, that. Actually, we have a lot of the students that actually say well i've seen this on social media yeah. i've seen this on instagram but that actually can be quite confusing. Yeah, no, definitely. And I think that's the problem is it's such a minefield with yeah. nutrition because everybody's trying to launch their latest, newest trend. Yeah. But it doesn't necessarily mean it's the best for health or performance. Yeah. So I think looking for, you know, resources and information that's, you know, valid and important. So for example, like on my Instagram, I'll only ever share stuff which I believe is, you know, actually true yeah. um, and has good research back in it. And also 
you know, my inbox or invoice or whatever is always open for questioning. And you'll okay. notice the good kind of nutritionists will always answer your questions as well. I think yeah. getting that one-to-one -one support is so important. Yeah. Yes, it's not accessible for everybody um, to go away and buy a, buy a program or a package for whatever that might be. But, you know, you can still reach out to these nutritionists and ask those questions. Yeah. And I think as well, just be smart as well. You know, if something seems like it's too good to be true, it probably is. If somebody's promising that you're going to build X amount of muscle by going across this diet, and you know that you've been told by a nutritionist in the past that it's just about getting your protein intake right and your carbohydrate intake right, then that's probably not going to be the best practice for you following this extreme diet or nutrition plan. Yeah. You know, sticking to the basics is what's going to achieve the results. Yeah, it's a, it's a complete minefield. Like it's, yes. if, if if I look on social media or I, I sort of talk to people in the, the sporting industry, it's it's even for me, which I sort of think I've got a little bit of knowledge of it, no, nowhere near of, of your level, but I think I know a little bit. But even when I sort of look at things, it's, there's a real sort of a big contrast of information that's going out there. And one of our things that we're sort of trying to deliver is we have, um, on the Elite Pathway, we have students who are Irish dancers to, to rugby players. Now, for me, that, that's very difficult to sort of give them that individual yeah. sort of advice. But how does that differ? So you must work with students who are or, or, or athletes that are maybe sort of each end of the, end of the spectrum. Yeah. Um, how does nutrition differ? those sort of students or those athletes yeah i think you know you saying that made me laugh a little bit then because i work with athletes that are downhill skiers all the way through to you know equestrian or yeah or, or ice hockey or whatever it might be there's such a diverse range especially in schools and something we look to do is promote the nutrition for those sports yeah and don't get me wrong there's times i'll go in and somebody will tell me what their sport is a i won't know what the sport is yeah, yeah. or b i won't know what the nutrition demands are so yeah. sometimes it does take me to say look i'll be back to you on this with a few infographics or a bit more information once I've done a little bit of research around yeah. it. But I think, yeah, making sure that everybody's on the same baseline is the most important. So for myself, we always start with like an introduction to nutrition session. Okay. And we always start with the basics of cooking. We always start with those base level um, kind of nutrition principles that I want everybody to take through to their sport. And then depending on what sport they do, it'll depend on what individualization we give them. So for example, if it's a, you know, a mountain biker, they might want to be con concentrating on the skill level. So we want to make sure that they've got plenty of carbohydrates, plenty of hydration, to ensure that that skill and concentration's in there whilst they're taking part in their event. Yeah. And then obviously with the rugby players, for example, it might be that they want power, speed and strength. So it's looking towards how we can gain that through nutrition and you know, looking at making sure that they're hitting their protein intake to ensure muscle growth and recovery, making sure they're having carbohydrates for energy, and then also making sure they're having some good sources of fats as well for that additional energy, and also yeah. to help the body grow and develop into you know, a good, strong individual rugby player. Yeah. But I think the importance lies with you know, the, the variety of different sports. And actually there's only small tweaks and changes that need making yeah. to ensure that that athlete can perform at their best. So yeah. one of the things I look towards doing is trying to find that kind of middle ground where they can all learn from. And then we deviate off into each different section to ensure that every student gets the optimal nutrition they require. Yeah, yeah. And, and even when you talk then I can sort of, sort of see how complex this is. And one of our young athletes came to me and said, what, what are macros, so what <laughs> should I be having? And actually, even then, like if we're looking at sort of even going in depth as, as macros, now is there any sort of easy easy term that you could sort of give our sort of young athletes sort of that again, what are macros and, and do these students need to be to go in depth if they do what a career in sport at their age? Let's say you've got a, a twelve year old footballer who's concerned about macros. Is that a no, is that is that normal? Should should he be worried or should she be worried about this? So I think a lot of people mistake of macros and calories as the same thing. Yeah. Now, macros are the type of components of the nutrients that you need to do well in sport and to perform at your best, yeah. whereas calories are just energy. So what I like to say to people is just remember that we don't need to be talking calories or calorie deficits or surpluses, especially at a development age, because we're not looking to change the body much. We're looking to give it the most natural growth as possible so you can become the best athlete possible. So what I tend to do is split away energy and calories as two different things. But macros are important to understand, but it doesn't mean that you have to put all your emphasis into them. Yeah. So it's important to understand that there's three types of macronutrients, them being the largest kind of nutrients that you can get hold of. First one is carbohydrates. Yeah. All we got to remember is carbohydrates are your energy. So you, all I want you to imagine, especially as a student, is you know imagine you're a car, let's say a Ferrari, and you need to be putting that fuel in the engine. Your carbohydrates are your fuel source for the body. So if you want to perform at your best, run as fast as you can for as long as you can, 
you need carbohydrates in the body to ensure that you can do that. Yeah. Now it does get a little bit more complicated as we go down the education side and types of what types of carbohydrates are the best. Yeah. But any carbohydrates are good carbohydrates and that's something to remember. Yeah. When it comes to proteins, which is the second macronutrient, we're looking towards the recovery, the growth and the development element of muscles. So for example, I get a lot of young females, specifically athletes worried about their protein intake. If they have too much protein, are they going to grow huge muscles like yeah. the rugby players? It's not true because that will depend on your training style. If you train heavy lifting and heavy strength, your muscles are going to grow bigger. But what protein does is it aids the recovery and the growth. Yeah. So it actually ties into the style of you know training you do to ensure that you recover better for games and you also are able to perform at your best when it comes around to that next performance bout. And then finally, fats are demonized a lot. And as a nutritionist, I have to do a lot of work fighting that back because a lot of people consider if you eat fat, you get fat. And that's not true at all. Fats are so important for your nutrition and so important for sport. They help with hormonal regulation. They help with you know general health. Um, so like looking after the joints and the muscles and the tissues. And they also help with digesting other nutrients. So if you were to have a nutrition plan that had zero fats, you wouldn't actually absorb the maximum carbohydrates and proteins. Yeah. So you've got to find and strike that balance. And depending on which sport you play and the style of sport you play, you might also use fats for energy. So those sports that are high endurance, ultra running, et cetera, you know, marathon running, they'll go at the first hour of their performance, they'll use the carbohydrates. Yeah. But then following that, they'll start to go towards those fat stores. So depending on the sport will depend on how many of each of those components you need. But they're all really important for any athlete. And it's yeah. important we get a good mix of all three macronutrients in there. Yeah, that's really interesting. So another one, mm -hmm. another question that I'm faced with. Should our young people be having protein shakes? No. No. It's not needed. So there's two sides to the story, okay? The first one is, you know, you maybe get to 16. You might be one of the bigger lads, one of the prop forwards, the second rows, you know, in rugby, for example. And you might be wanting to look towards getting that extra protein in. Yeah. Now, if you can show me and demonstrate to me that you're eating the absolute maximum protein foods that you can, and that's including adding chickpeas into meals, making sure that you're getting kidney beans and all the different beans that come with proteins, yeah. as well as meat, yeah. then okay, maybe we're looking towards protein. So for example, in my Warrington days with the big rugby lads, some of them are needing excess amount of protein that they wouldn't be able to get in their food. Yeah. And a protein shake is very convenient for them to have after yeah. training. And just tick that box as well for protein. But as a young developing a a athlete, yeah. what you want to be looking towards is the highest nutrient content protein. And that comes from having you know, various different sources of protein. So yeah. your meats, your pulses, you know, your tofus, you know, all the different types. And I think as well, it's important to remember when it comes to protein, the body can only really absorb around 20 to 30 grams of protein for muscle recovery yeah. at, at one time. So if you're having, you know, a, like I hear a lot of young lads having double protein shakes because they're getting 60 grams of protein in. Now that protein's not going to go to waste. It'll be used in different areas of the body. But the sole purpose of having that protein shake was to increase muscle mass yeah. and also increase recovery. But actually only 20 to 30 percent, uh, 20 to 30 grams of that, sorry, um, is actually going towards that. Yeah. So to me, food first is always the most important, especially during your growth and development yeah. phases. <laughs> You say that, that final sentence yeah. again. What was the last From word? food first. Yes. Yeah. So you yeah. go from food. Can you edit that? Yes. Yeah. Right. But yeah. Cut. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't, actually, I spoke to Dan about that last day. Because he did. He said the bell will go. Yeah. Anyway. Mm. Right. Yeah. So we go from food yeah, first. Yeah. So yeah. So food first is the most important because it's more nutrient dense and more nutrient rich. And I always think, you know, if we're looking for that growth and development side, and that's what most young athletes are looking for, they're still on that path of growth and development. Yeah. They've not hit their final form that I like to say. Yeah. And actually, if you can get more nutrients into the body through eating food, it's much better than any shake or powder or bar that you'd possibly be able yeah. to get hold of on the market. So to play devil's advocate a little bit, yeah. so so what we've got a student who is in school all day. Mm -hmm. They maybe then play for the school team yeah. and have training at seven o'clock. They don't get to go home because it's yeah. just they haven't got the time and they're starving, but they know they've had inevitably... Full day of work, effectively. Yeah. They play the game, and then they go into training. Yeah. So I have parents coming to me and saying, "Well, what, what, what can my my son or what can my daughter have in the car? Is a protein shake then? Would would you advise that? Or what? What? And is there anything else that you could say? Actually, it's really important. I know prep is important. Yeah. But actually, trying to get a young person to do that as well as everything else. Is there anything else that you think actually 
this would be a really good thing to have. So there is some anomalies where that might be the case, but I think it needs to be addressed in terms of what they're doing at the rest of the day as well. So you know, right. what I tend to do is speak with that parent and find out kind of what kind of snacks are you already included in the day. So for example, there's protein in yogurts. Yeah. So you could have a yogurt on the way home from training or on the way to training. Yeah. Or for example, you know, I one of my favorites that a lot of students like is a Yazoo milkshake. Right. It's got enough protein in there and it has carbohydrates. So if we're looking for recovery between bouts of exercise, we want to be having carbs and protein because yeah. as we remember earlier, we we're saying carbs are your fuel, protein's yeah. your recovery. So if we're going to do two training sessions in a day, one after school and then maybe another training session afterwards, we need to find what we're going to do in the middle ground that's going to be able to promote the best recovery, but also energy as well from that point of view. So I think looking towards the Yazoo's or something like that, that's a carb protein mix or like a yogurt with a rice cake, you know, really, really simple snacks yeah. that you can take in the car with you can actually trump a, uh, you know, protein shake, yeah. for example. And I think it's important that in some cases, you know, the convenience is going to kick in. If the, if the student's going to go without anything, I'd rather it be something like a protein shake. But if there's opportunity to plan ahead for the day and ensure that they've got those snacks and those meals available, yeah. then I don't see the need or necessary, um, you know, caution to take with yeah. having a shake. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, just, just one that feels like I'm sort of asking a bit of advice now, or sort of constant asking advice. Oh, that's fine. But again, another instance we've had this year is a student who is a rugby player, very good rugby player, yeah. um, rightly or wrongly, has been told that he needs to lose body fat. Okay. But he's very conscious of, of not losing weight. Yes. Because traditionally he plays, he needs weight to be effective, but their club feel he needs to lose body fat. Yeah. Do you agree with that? Or do you think actually, as a 15-year-old, that's not really consideration or is there anything that you could sort of give him that advice to say well actually maybe think about this yeah i think there's again two sides to that story so you know i don't know the in-depth detail of no, what he's no. currently eating but i would say that there's a lot of pressure from academies um especially professional sports that they take what they use with the first team players and bring it down to the academy level such as testing the body fat percentages and i you know i was at guilt for this at warrington i used to test body fat of players and they'd want to know the result and they'd want to know whether they were high, low or, you know, in yeah. range. Um, and that does and can play an effect on, you know, the psychological performance of a player. Um, now, looking at his foods, for example, if we saw that his diet was trash and he was having, you know, terrible meals and nothing was tailored towards his sport or his performance, yeah. then certainly, you know, maybe giving him a bit of a kick and say, look, we need to drop that body fat percentage down here's some foods that are going to promote that a yeah. little bit healthier. Whereas if he was told this without any guidance, then I think that's where it's important. But simple stuff that he could do is, you know, just making sure you're ticking the boxes. So before you go into training, you're having carbohydrates. After you finish training, you're having a good hit of protein. Yeah. You're eating, you know, you, you know, you're eating to what your body desires. If you're hungry, you're not going to go snack on crisps. You're going to yeah. go have something that's going to develop you as a performing player. So, you know, it could be like a chicken Caesar salad wrap or yeah. something along the lines of that. Whereas I find a lot of academy kids, because they run around all the time, they can get away with eating what they want, unlike yeah. probably yourself and yeah. I. Um, you know, then they'll have a they'll have a pack of biscuits after training. Yeah. Now that's not the best practice, and what that will do is increase the body fat of a player and reduce the muscle mass of a player. So I think if he wants to hold on to his weight and keep hold of his muscle, it's just about fine tuning. So you know, making sure that you're eating, um, you know, within a scope of maybe 80, 20 percent. So 80 yeah. percent of the time having the best foods that you possibly can that are going to direct towards rugby, towards the gym or whatever training else that he's doing. And then 20% of the time enjoying those fun foods. So across yeah. the day, if he looked at what he was eating, he could see that he was having maybe 80% of the time best foods and then still enjoying himself. I think what he can't go and do is become 100% fixed in on a, you know, a full health uh, performance because not even the professional athletes do so. So yeah. I think it's so important to make sure that He's looking after his body, but also looking after his mental well-being as well yeah. at the same time. Yeah. Um, so finally, Dan, if you, if you could give one bit of advice to a young athlete when it comes to nutrition, what would that be? I think listen to your body. You know, you're all young, you're all different, and don't copy what your friends are doing. Far too often I hear, you know, one person has bought creatine or a protein shake, so I'm going to do the same. But he could be on a completely different stage of development and growth as you. Or, for example, somebody who may be 16, has been told they need to drop you know, yeah. body fat and they've gone on an, a specialist diet that's been delivered by a nutritionist and by a health professional and you're trying to copy this when you're not at that level. So yeah. I think listen to your own body. You know it better than anybody else and eat when you're hungry. Ensure that you're always topping up that fuel stores because you're going to be using it across the day at school. Yeah. You're going to be using it in training. 
even walking home from school, biking home from school, whatever it might be, you're going to be using energy constantly, a lot more than what your parents are going to be doing. So if you're overeating on what your parents are doing, that's fine. But then also listen to your body at the same time. If you're full, you don't need to eat that full pack of biscuits, you know, or there could be some healthier alternatives, or you don't need to go through six bags of crisps when you get home, because that's not going to be derivative of performance and it's not going to help with your overall performance. So I think always have performance on the forefront of the mind, but also health at the same time and look after both aspects and that'll look after your body and it'll make sure that you have a long and developing career as whatever athlete you might be. Great. Well, Dan, thank you very much for today. Very, very interesting. Um, yeah, thanks very much. Thank you. Oh, that was the end. Thanks. <laughs>